We are starting with slide 20, where we're going to uh, begin with symbiotic relationships. Remember that symbiosis in biology is a close association between two different species. Um, they live in very close association with one another. And there are three different relationships that are symbiotic. There is parasitism, which can also be considered a type of predation, but it's a type of a symbiotic relationship as well, in which one species benefits, that's the parasite, and the other species is harmed, and that would be the host. In commensalism, you have one species that benefits from the relationship, but another species that doesn't appear to be affected in any way, benefited nor harmed. And then we have mutualism, which is where both species benefit from the relationship. Sometimes there's going to be um, a question as to whether or not it's commensalism or mutualism. Sometimes it's hard to tell with one of the species whether they're being affected or not. But we're going to talk about some different examples. In parasitism, the parasite derives nourishment from a host. So the parasite causes some harm to the host, but doesn't attempt to kill it. Um, so it's, it, it, it is a type of predation, but not in the sense a predator actually is hunting down the prey and trying to kill it and eat it whereas a parasite just wants to live off of it. So really it's in, most of the time, it's in the parasite's benefit for its host to live, at least for a, a period of time. Um, now, if the parasite is small, it tends to be an endoparasite. A heartworm is an endoparasite, um, meaning that it lives inside of its host. If the parasite is large, it tends to be an ectoparasite. For an example, that would be like a leech that lives on the outside of its host. The effect of the parasite on the health of the host can range from slightly weakening them to killing them over time. But you do need to remember it's not in the parasite's best interest to kill the host outright. It needs to live off of it, so it normally doesn't kill the host immediately anyway. Here's a picture of um, dog heartworms, which are definitely a, a death sentence to a dog if they can't, you know, if they can't be killed and treated, um, but it is a slow process. Now, in commensalism, one species benefit benefits and the other is neither benefited nor harmed. An example, and this you may remember if you've ever seen the cartoon Finding Nemo. I know it's old, but a lot of people have seen it. Um, this relationship is the clownfish and the sea anemone. So the clownfish lives within the tentacles of the sea anemone. The sea anemone appears to be unaffected by this. Um, the clownfish is able to um, get a shelter, you know, um, from the relationship. Then they give an example of egrets. Um, a cattle egret, which is a bird, stays near the cattle um, and the cattle um, eats, you know, is a herbivore, of course, and so it flushes out the prey of the egret. The egret removes ectoparasites from the cattle. So it, it it may be that by moving the ectoparasites from the cattle that um, the cattle is benefiting. The egret definitely benefits. Um, but the question is whether or not the cattle benefits from the relationship. I think most cases, I mean, this, I listen to what I'm saying. I said, I think, and so this is my opinion. But in my opinion, most cases of commensalism are probably mutualism. There's probably some ben benefit to both. Um, I believe, it, both of the organisms in the relationship. Um, but here's your egret, pretty little white birds. And then here is your bison and um, buffalo, whichever one you call call it. But um, the, because the egret lives so closely with the bison, it's able to get, um, get food when the bison kind of flushes out its prey as it's grazing. 
um, because the egret eats little um, insects that live, you know, among the grass. But also the egret is eating ectoparasites off of the uh, bison, so it, it may actually be a mutualistic relationship. But there are some that are just clear case, clear cases of mutualism. That's when both benefit. Um, plants and their pollinators, flowering plants and their pollinators are not only a case of mutualism, but also an example of co-evolution. So the flowers benefit because the, let's just use a pollinator, let's just say a bee, okay? So the bee is the pollinator, the flower is the plant, and let's say um, the bee is benefiting because it gets nectar from the flower, and the flower is benefiting because the bee helps to pollinate, um, helps to take its pollen from, um, from the flower to another flower, you know, and pollinate the other fla pollinate other flowers. So the bees help pollinate the flowers. The flowers give food to the bees. Um, over the years, there has been evolution on the part of the flowers to, especially in the sense of smell and the color of the petals, the flowers have evolved to become more attractive and easier for the bees to to spot, you know, easier for the bees to um, find them. And then the bees have evolved senses that, you know, allow them to find the flowers. They, they have a waggle dance. I think we talked about that in an earlier chapter. Um, over, the, over the years, they've evolved to where they can do a waggle dance that tells all the other bees where the flowers are. So they, um, they have evolved traits over the years to help them be able to work together even better, you know, to help each other out even more. Um, this is a Clark's Nutcracker, which I'm going to skip. Um, we've got fish that have um, other fish that clean them, um, which is a, a symbiosis because one gets cleaned and the other one gets food, you know. Um, so there's there's a lot of examples of symbiosis in nature. I mean, there's too many to name, but flowers and po their pollinators are probably the best example of mutualism. All right, moving on to section two. I really, from this section, I really just want you to know the difference between primary and secondary succession. So succession is how, is the steps that a community takes from basically just being, um, you know, bare rock or, um, you know, like just a fallow, a field that has gone fallow that has, you know, no plants growing in it to growing into a, a um, what they call a climax community, which is the, like the forest or the, the tropical rainforest or, you know, just the, the community that is, has established itself and is going to be there for many, many, many generations. So succession is the steps of a community growing, you know, and if it's primary succession, it means that there is no soil. So the community has to start with the formation of soil. Um, so it's the formation of soil from exposed rock due to wind, water, and other abiotic factors. So primary succession begins with the formation of soil, but secondary succession starts where there already is soil. Okay, there may not be any, any plants, but there is soil established. So there used to be plants. You'll see primary succession, for example, after a volcano erupts and covers the soil, covers the ground with lava. Everything is destroyed. All the plant life is destroyed. The soil, the ground is now covered in solid rock. And so any new community is going to have to start by creating soil little um, mosses and lichens are going to have to grow in the rock and it's going to have to break apart and you know um, wind and water and and weather is going to have to break the rock apart and form soil that's going to take a long time but once the soil forms then you're going to have grasses that come in and then taller plants and then even taller plants and trees that will come in and that's what succession is it's when you have um plants replacing, you know, you, you have grasses first, and then you have plants that come in and replace the grasses until you finally have a stable community that includes, you know, um, some really tall trees. 
Um, you do need to know the first producers, the first plants to inhabit a community after a disturbance are called pioneer species. A lot of times they're mosses and grasses. Um, this is showing you the stages of primary succession. Um, you have uh, an area that's covered in nothing but rock. So the lichens grow on the rock and um, the combination of the lichens growing into the rock and breaking the rock apart, as well as water and wind and other uh, weather, freezing and thawing, all this stuff that breaks rocks apart. That happens in stage in, in uh, the first stage, which is shown in picture A. Then you have the shrub stage, picture B. Grasses and small, short shrubs come into the area and grow in the soil that has formed. Then you have C, the low tree stage, and then you have D, the high tree stage, where large trees dominate the landscape. In secondary succession, you don't start out with bare rock, you start out with grasses. So it's grasses, low shrubs, higher, taller shrubs, a mixture of trees and shrubs, low trees, high trees, and then you have your climax community. And this is just a forest community. The climax community um, is the mature and stable community that always happens after many years of succession. And the facilitation model of succession says that each stage facilitates invasion and replacement by organisms of the next stage. But I'm just telling you, there's all these models here. I'm going to skip just because um, you can, the inhibition model, the tolerance model, but the main thing is to go back and know the difference between primary and secondary succession because those are the only examples I gave you in, in the um, exam, okay, in your quiz questions and your exam questions. So now let's move on to section three, um, and we won't cover much from section four either, but let's cover section three um, and make sure that we understand the dynamics of an ecosystem, all the factors that play a part in keeping an e ecosystem healthy. So in an ecosystem, populations interact among themselves and they interact with the physical environment. The abiotic components of the ecosystem are the non-living components. It in, they, they would include the atmosphere, the air, the water, and the soil. The biotic components of an ecosystem are the living things, and they can be categorized as autotrophs or heterotrophs based on whether they make their own food, um, like plants, you know, through photosynthesis, or whether or not they consume food. Autotrophs require only inorganic nutrients and an outside energy source to produce organic nutrients. So they have to have organic nutrients, but autotrophs make that food themselves. For example, plants, well, we're going to get there because photoautotrophs are down here. Um, so back to the notes, autotrophs generate the food for their own use and for all other members of the community because the other, the heterotrophs eat them. Some heterotrophs eat them. Some heterotrophs eat other heterotrophs. The um, producers are autotrophs, and we call them producers because they produce food from inorganic nutrients like carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is an inorganic nutrient um, that producers, um, photosynthetic organisms, can convert into um, glucose and other organic food. If they're called photoautotrophs, it means they get their energy from sunlight. Land plants and algae are photoautotrophs. Green plants are the dominant photosynthesizers on land. And what they do is they convert carbon dioxide, which is the inorganic nutrient, into glucose, which is the organic nutrient or the food. And they, um, they do that through the process of photosynthesis and they use sunlight for the energy to um, carry out photosynthesis. But some autotrophs are what we call chemoautotrophs, and these are bacteria. Some bacteria obtain energy by oxidizing or breaking down inorganic compounds 
and using that energy to synthesize organic compounds. Um, some of these bacteria support hydrothermal vent communities. Um, they live where it's too hot and too acidic for most organisms to live, but they take those um, acids, a lot, of, a lot of those chemicals that they um, break down and use for energy contain sulfur, um, sulfuric acid and, and sulfur dioxide, and a lot of these chemicals that contain sulfur they will break those chemicals down for energy because if they live in hydrothermal vents, they don't have access to sunlight. They're somewhere deep in the ocean at the opening of a, a, a volcano that's underwater, you know, and um, it's very, very hot there. So they, they, um, they're able to survive there and thrive there, but they don't have sunlight for energy. So they have to break down the chemicals that are released by the hydrothermal vent and that gives them their energy. Um, we're looking here at diatoms, which are a type of algae. They're um, producers in the um, aquatic environments. And then of course, trees that are producers in um, terrestrial environments. Now, I'm sure that you've seen these terms before. We know producers produce food and, and they're autotrophs and consumers consume food and we call them heterotrophs. And then we have these other terms based on um, how they eat and what they eat. And um, we're running over time, so I'll come back to, this is slide number 36. We'll start with 36 in the next recording.